I think everyone deliberately tries to grow. Our very deliberate approach to that was more about if we were already the really big business that had just dominated and done really well, if we had a hundred times the customers, what product would we have? That then drove, okay, well immediately we are now gonna try and have that product. You know, so the quality of product that we went to market with, you know, was three, four, five hundred pages. When we were writing our workouts, we literally had considerations like, how many times does a person have to turn over during this workout? And how many times do they have to stand up and sit down during this workout? So if we can remove all of the thinking, if we can remove all of the extra effort other than actually jumping up and down and getting sweaty and doing the exercises and whatever, then like, you know, we, we kind of have the opinion that that's gonna be a massive value add. Welcome to episode 118 of Be The Drop, a weekly podcast sharing stories from successful entrepreneurs to help you tell your story and grow your business. I'm Amelia Veal, Director at Narrative Marketing and firm believer in the superpower of storytelling. Growth in business can seem elusive and difficult to obtain, yet 26-year-old Toby Pierce is very clear on the methods, the conditions and the mindset that has driven his international business success. In this forthcoming interview, Toby shares many strategies and tools that have helped him build a global fitness business. Together with his fiancée, Kayla Itzines, Toby has built a highly successful online fitness company that attracts millions of customers and followers. His background in personal training and the discipline gained from strict health regimes has facilitated Toby to run business efficiently and effectively. The couple have been very strategic in capitalising on social media, which has been pivotal in driving their success. In today's episode of Be The Drop, Toby discusses the five-year journey of his business, Sweat, and shares insights on taking products to market, how to do market research, and how to manage language barriers when expanding into international markets. This is Toby's version of Be The Drop. Would you like to join me on a creative podcasting journey? Then head along to my first ever Adelaide Fringe show called Pop Your Podcast Cherry, an interactive podcasting event on Tuesday 19th or 26th of February at the J. Tickets are only $20 each and are available via the Fringe website. Link in the show notes. I would love to see you there. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Toby, on our next episode of Be The Drop. No, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here in the Sweat headquarters, which seem to sprawl over a few locations. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, definitely quite a few uh, quite a few floors and, and rooms here, yeah. It's great. Well, we definitely want to delve in and talk about some of that growth and yeah. what that journey has been, because it's been a pretty fast track journey, um, but I'm sure at times it hasn't felt that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. How about if we just start at the bit of the beginning mm-hmm. and you could just give us maybe like in the short summary form Mm -hmm. where it all started how it began yep i'll I'll compress probably the better part of five years back into hopefully less than like two or three (laughs) minutes um but uh i I was a personal trainer uh in a gym my fiance kayla was also a personal trainer in a gym we didn't actually know each other at the time but we were both kind of doing okay in our own in our own businesses at this point we've been using social media to market our existing businesses so the boot camp and the studio and stuff um, and realized that we, we'd done pretty well probably maybe about 50,000 fans I think at this point and we said like oh well you know there's a there's a good opportunity here we had other people asking online being like oh like oh, yeah, I'd love to do your your workouts but you know I'm, I live in a different state or I live in a different country or whatever so we kind of had this conversation at one point and said oh well, you know what, what would what would the big thing be if we were to do it how would we do it would it just be that we'd open a lot of boot camps everywhere and get people to run them for us um, I think we kind of agreed that that wasn't necessarily the best path forward yes yeah, so we kind of went back to the drawing board and then sort of like oh well you know the internet is definitely a thing um, it's a real thing now um, you know there's there's people kind of doing this ebook thing so obviously truth be told kind of a few months later um, yeah took the photos and wrote the program and put the meal plan together and you know did all the the, the content creation you know time came around and we eventually launched it and then um, that was when things really sort of started to transform it was like wow like people genuinely really do love what we are doing um, they love the way that it makes them feel we didn't properly understand it at that point in time but that's obviously kind of a really key foundation for a good company yeah do people like what you're doing will they keep doing it and will they tell other people about it 
but there was kind of you know a few different questions in the back of our minds which we we're trying to answer which were sort of you know this is great and we love doing this and you know, I think at one point we, we'd, we'd touched about maybe 10 million people we'd reach globally and we were sort of like wow like this is you know pretty epic and um, me with my personality was like yeah it is but how do we do 100 million people <laughs> um, so um, that was then kind of another back to the drawing board you know type thing and um, you know a lot, of, a lot of strategy and a lot of planning and sort of conversations happened and we kind of came out the other side of this saying well we currently sell an ebook and we don't know anything about what our users are doing or really who they are so let's you know let's let's pivot to a platform that allows us to get that information um, you know let's uh, if we want to make it available to more people you know we need to make it probably a little bit cheaper and also allow people to pay like on a recurring basis rather than this big once you know upfront fee um, you know, we, we want to make it accessible to people on the go. So we went from kind of having like a document format into a mobile app. Um, and, uh, you know, and we obviously had the consideration all around, well, you know, maybe not everyone wants to do Kayla's workouts. Yeah, you know, like I'm sure lots of people obviously love them. And I think we've, we've validated that. But like, what about all the other women in the world who want to, you know, how, how do we help them? So, yeah, so out of all of those problems, what kind of happened was, okay, cool. So we're going to pivot from an ebook to an app. And we did that. Um, we wanted to pivot from, you know, Kayla's content to other people. We didn't really know how to do that at that point in time. But that was kind of where we generated this idea for what Sweat would become, which is, you know, the company we run now. You know, so we, we made a few of these really big strategic pivots over the period of about probably, you know, 18 months or two years. And then, um, it kind of worked a little bit, and um, you know now we're now we're a few years down the track, and you know we're running a pretty decent business out of Adelaide. So yeah, uh, I, I like that. It kind of worked. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like it did. Yeah, that's good. That's huge growth. Mm. Uh, you were like, oh, 10 million people. How do we get to 100? So mm. your scale is pretty big, which yeah. is great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that helps. Is probably part of why you're yeah. getting those numbers. But what do you think is one of the key things that really helped? Yeah. fuel that initial growth mm. because I mean 50,000 even your 50,000 followers at the mm. beginning was great but yeah. the difference between 50,000 to a million is big and there's so many businesses that are trying to mm. make that move so what do you think is one of the key things or the yeah. key factors a number of key factors that really helped that initial growth yeah look I think everyone deliberately tries to grow our very deliberate approach to that was more about you know kind of considering rather than just we want to grow we want to grow we want to grow it was more about if we were already the really big business that had just dominated and done really well, if we had a hundred times the customers, what product would we have? And what would that product include that we don't currently have now? That then drove, okay, well, immediately we are now going to try and have that product. You know, so the quality of the product that we went to market with, you know, was three, four, five hundred pages. The quality of the product that a lot of our competitors went to market with was 30, 40 or 50 pages. Um, you know, the level of detail we had was significantly higher. You know, we put a lot more thought into things, um, you know, to go, to go like in a really, really specific level to provide an example. When we were writing our workouts, we literally had considerations like, how many times does a person have to turn over during this workout? And how many times do they have to stand up and sit down during this workout? And how many pieces of equipment do they need? If you're not really in love with fitness, and even for people who are, it's really hard. Mm-hmm. You know, and like, so if we can remove all of the thinking, if we can remove all of the extra effort other than actually jumping up and down and getting sweaty and doing the exercises and whatever, then like, you know, we, we kind of have the opinion that that's going to be a massive value add. Um, so you know, that, that's only an example of one of the small things, but you know, there's, there's just an array of those sorts of considerations that we had along the journey about how we make our product better, you know, how do we make our marketing better, you know, how, how do we grow the business. Mm. So. Do you think that having that business background with both Kayla and yourself being personal trainers already, it was mm. easy for you to really put yourself in the shoes of your clients because you're directly working with them at mm. that point? Mm. Well, so I think there's there's kind of two ends of the spectrum here. And you know, one is, um, so in, in the software space now, um, we say our goal at any moment in time is to achieve product market fit, fully accepting that we will never achieve product market fit because market always moves. Right, so effectively we're just chasing. So and what that really means is like product market fit could be defined as we provide everything in the way that the customer wants it, exactly how the customer wants it to do what the customer wants, you know, and then we make it as good as possible, basically. Now, obviously, yes, there is some argument about, you know, the the customer doesn't always necessarily know what they, you know, need, but they know what they want and you know, so you balance that and whatever. But I think, you know, that's the that's the first thing. When you're a personal trainer, one of the first things that you learn is that it doesn't really matter what workout you want the person to do. It only matters what workout they will do. 
Right, yeah, so like if you go up to someone and you're like, oh, like this is the most efficient, effective type of training that you have to do, it will get you the best results, and I recommend that you do it. And they're like, cool, I hate it, <laughs> right? When a lot of people approach business and product development early on, they kind of go like, oh, this is what the customer wants, this is what they need, this is how they want it, and this is how they should do it, right? The only way that we were ever gonna be able to figure out to make the best product possible was literally just by asking. But as a PT, like that's a really kind of conventional thing that you do, you know, even if it's something as simple as like, okay, we're gonna do these exercises now, like, you know, any, any problems with that? No, okay, cool. So this is the first one, like, does that feel okay? Do you like that? Like, do you understand that? And these are general coaching questions that you ask for clients when you're training them, but obviously in a digital product, you don't have that. So you've got to find different ways of acquiring the same info, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so in that transition of going from the ebook and that, that fitness to producing an app, mm -hmm. there's a lot of technology that's gone in there. And so in a mm -hmm. way, of, you know, you've gone into app development, which is almost like adding a technology arm to the business. Yeah, very much so. We very often have conversations internally in the company about like, well, you know, what company are we? You know, and initially it was kind of like, oh, like, well, we're definitely a health and fitness business. You know, and then over the last, you know, kind of three or four years, there's been a bit of transition. It's like, well, okay, no, we're not really actually like a health and fitness company. Like we, we have a portion of our business that is a software company. So we have a team of people who make an app. You know, we have a um, effectively almost like a talent management and agency internally because we work with you know, our trainers. We help them to build their brands, you know, so on and so forth. Um, you know, we have a media and public publishing industry, uh, publishing business because we generate content. We have our own production studio, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then yes, health and fitness sits over the top of all of that. Yeah, and that's the reason why we are here, and that's the foundational the foundation for it. Um, but yeah, like exactly what you're saying about the fact that we we at that point in time going from ebooks to an app basically pivoted from being a not software company to becoming a software company. Um, and I'm sure we can all probably understand that the learnings were a little um, mm. potentially painful along the way, but mm. yeah. Well, and so what are the biggest challenges with that? And, and not just with that going from the ebook to the, to the tech, but the fact that you've got, as you said, you've got your talent mm. and then you know, you've got yeah. your media side and you've got the software yeah. within this umbrella of health and mm. fitness. That's a lot to manage within a business yeah. structure. What are the biggest yeah. challenges around that? Um, I think communication is probably a hard one and I don't mean like as in getting people to talk like I think obviously we all talk and that's fine um, but I think more so in the sense that you've got you know in a, in a traditional business you you know or in a more you know I guess uh, archaic like operating model you would typically see that there will be a manufacturing portion portion of the organization they sit there and they do their stuff and they don't talk to other teams, you know, and then there'll be a marketing team, you know, we'll sit there and do their stuff and there'll be a sales team and, you know, and whatever, right? But typically it was very siloed, right? Whereas for us, like, um, you know, not only do we think that's not necessarily the best way to do that, but I guess like from a functional standpoint, like we have to have sports scientists and nutrition scientists talk to software engineers who have to talk to marketing people, you know, who have to talk to designers, you know, and so there's so much different subject matter being thrown around by multiple people who equally and respectfully are only subject matters in their own particular area, but they have to understand subject matter from elsewhere. So, that, you know, managing that communication is a really tremendously difficult thing. Yeah, common language, a challenge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and because we all process information differently. I think internal comms is something that gets so underrated frequently. Yeah. The amount of money yeah. that businesses spend on external marketing, but don't yeah. reflect that back internally on their internal Agreed, yeah. communications and marketing, mm. it, it astounds me mm. because it can cause massive business issues as yep. you're saying so one of the big things then is international growth mm -hmm. you've gone through you've built you know a successful business and taken mm -hmm. it from the ebook to the app yep. but you've also then had an amazing success internationally as well from yeah. little old Adelaide which yep. is which is great and you know and I'm, I, I personally don't think it's little old Adelaide that's mm. why I'm really happy to live here but it does have a bit of that mm. perception sometimes but the great thing is you've certainly built this internationally recognized yeah. business yeah, definitely. so what how did that come about? I mentioned a little bit earlier on, like I think if, if you ever do kind of really, really well in e-commerce or with social media, like the reality is that you have the ability to be discovered by anyone who has the internet or social media. So look, as much as your market market might be in geo you know, X, you know, you can't kind of just explicitly post your content on social media to those people like you know the platform will display it to the people who they deem as potentially being interested or engaged with that type of content right so um 
you know, early on, there was definitely no like, oh, we should deliberately, you know, target like Russia or, or whatever. It just, it was by, you know, by opportunity that it just so happened that we ended up having fans in Russia, for example. But, um, m you know, moving past that and actually getting to a point where we're saying like, okay, cool, globalization or localization of our product, like how do you make decisions about that? Well, yeah, that was definitely a lot easier because it was kind of like, well, you know, mm. out of these you know, 150 countries that we're serving at the moment, like what are our top performing countries? It's like, oh, okay, wow, like, you know, out of our top 10, like six of them are not actually like English, you know, for, as a first language speaking countries. That's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. How are we doing really well in these countries if they don't necessarily speak our language? And, you know, so then you learn, you, you learn to do country research and, and market research and this, that, the other. Um, yeah, and then we just came to a position where we were sort of like, oh, well, you know, we can quite easily quantify the expense of, you know, localizing our content. Um, you know, from, you know, say, for example, into German, um, you know, if we compare that to the amount of money that we're making there now, how much of a percentage lift would we need to have, you know, to realistically offset that in, you know, a variation of given time periods, for example, three, six, nine, 12 months? Oh, well, it would only be a few percent. And it's like, oh, I think we're definitely going to get a few percent increase, you know, just by localizing the product, you know? So we chose our first few countries. I think we did five countries when we initially did it. Um, we launched, saw an uplift in engagement and uplift in conversion in those countries. Um, yeah, and then the really interesting lesson that we had was about, well, that there's a really big differentiation between translation and localization. So for example, like if you went you know, down into our um, you know, localization area of the office at the moment, you'd see, oh, that's a, a Portuguese woman who actually like, spent the first 20 years of her life in Portugal. You know, so when I said to her, okay, not only can you obviously speak the language and your NATI accredited to do translation, you can actually say to me like, oh, like, can you have a look at my menu you know, that I've got here for you? And can you actually tell me if you were to go to the shops in Portugal, would you better buy those ingredients? Hmm. And like 50% of them is no, you can't. And then all of a sudden that's, so then you know, okay, well, I really need to look into that. You know, and then what well, just basic questions, what's school like over there? What's uni like? When do people get careers? Do they live at home? Do they not live at home? To help to build a profile about what's realistically available to those customers when relatively compared to say, for example, a traditional Western market such as Australia or America. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of differentiation, like mm -hmm. a lot, um, but that just helps you to make the product better. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I was surprised by the number of differences between Australia and America. So. Yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that international expansion, like how important was that as far as really the growth factor and, you know, cementing mm. that success? I think definitely pretty significant. Um, I mean, you know, one of the ways that we kind of view that is that the more markets that we have success in and provide customer satisfaction to, the more, the more people and the more different areas of the world are actually doing our branding and marketing for us. Um, you know, so like for example, we say like, yeah, look, even if we only have 10 successful customers, um, however you decide, define successful, but you know, if we have 10 successful customers in journey, hopefully they'll tell 10 to 20 of their friends. And out of those people, there'll be some successful ones and then they'll tell some of their friends. And so we, we kind of believe that it, it provides a compounding, you know, there's a compounding coefficient there, um, you know, to some degree that, that we would definitely attribute to a portion of our success. Mm, well, that people telling their stories is something you build mm. into your marketing a lot, yeah. you know, the before and afters and really yeah. highlighting your customers. Yeah, definitely. You know, what was the strategy around that? Typically, you know, uh, you know, why do we post transformation photos? Uh, a normal, a normal kind of um, marketing response would be like, oh well, you know, like proven results, like shows that the product is good, and you know, blah blah blah, and like that makes people buy. And like, of course, I'm sure that that is definitely like some, you know, some some part of it. But then a lot of people also go on to say like, oh yeah, like you know, that's what sent your brand viral. You know, like the engagement is just so massive. You know, blah blah blah, and. And I'm like, oh, well, like, have you actually looked at the engagement? And they're like, oh yeah, like it's huge. I'm like, hmm, it's interesting because like the the you know, consistently the lowest engaging posts on all of our pages are before and after photos. Well, why do you keep posting them then? And I'm like, because they get other forms of engagement, you know, and like because the the way that it um, is perceived by customers is an extremely powerful, um, extremely powerful emotive value. Uh, so we would typically say like yes while they may get slightly lower quantitative engagement so less reach and less likes and less comments um, the qualitative engagement is absolutely massive you know so for a woman looking into social media seeing another woman's body who is almost identical to hers whatever shape size um, background race age that she is and seeing how that woman's gone on to have a massive positive change in her life and achieve the goals that perhaps that woman also wants to achieve who's looking at that post on social media, that says, you know, I can do that. And that says that's possible. And that says, like, 
it's not impossible. And that says like, I could be like that person, you know? And so for us, like that, that sort of, you know, I guess secondary or tertiary emotional support and inspiration and such is, is a really huge driver for us. Mm. And I think also it, it, it kind of plays into a lot of our branding that like our product is not about us. You know, our product, and again, as being a personal trainer, like it's nothing to do with the personal trainer at all. It's all to do with what that trainer can do for you. And you know, and so by showing that, that this is examples of the things that you know we've been able to do and achieve with our you know amazing consumers and members of our platform. So, you know, look at it, it's, it's celebrate it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. But then, so I would have thought though that some of the Kayla pitches are one of the ones that do perform really highly as well. No? No, not really. So no. what is the highest performing then? Um, typically we find videos like, you know, like things that are actual like usable, you know, like, so for example, um, here's a, here's a leg workout that, you know, targets your, your bum or whatever, or, you know, here's a, um, here's an example and tutorial about how to do push ups properly. And they're definitely more kind of actionable, usable things. Um, the saying really interesting that, that we learned early on was that, like some of the posts that, you know, you would kind of go like, oh, like that would get like a lot of double taps and a lot of comments and whatever because um, it makes a lot of people want to you know do stuff and buy stuff like there's actually kind of a, a bit of a flaw in that assumption although likes and comments sure like from a quantitative perspective are ultra important and yes like it's definitely something that we track like I think there's also a lot of you know secondary you know potentially non-tangible things to consider as well mm. when looking at what your content marketing strategy is mm. and content marketing I mean you've created a, a content creation arm of your business so yep. that's obviously a huge part for you yeah you know where, where did that come about and why is that so important to the business we knew early on that when we launched out we would be creating a lot of content at a high velocity you know huge volume um, very specific look and feel um, and if we wanted to do that it needed to be a very very you know kind of templated experience um, you know so uh, you know if, if nothing else just purely from a business efficiency perspective it was kind of well how, how do we do that and scale that so you know we bought a we bought a small building um, a warehouse and we, we fitted that out as a, a gym which backs onto a studio so we're able we have a custom environment where we've got every single piece of gym equipment we want usable in a place where people can work out but then it's literally as simple as putting it on a dolly and wheeling it onto the filming set, filming it and moving it back. You know, if we were to if we were to do that elsewhere, you know, you got to truck in equipment, truck out equipment, you know, and they're not small pieces of equipment. Some of them weigh like four or five hundred kilos, like so it's mm. it's complicated. But I think um, for us earlier, we just had such specific requirements and needs and, and that, so we, we just went about it our own way. Um, we've built an abundance of like extremely powerful um, you know, software tools internally to help manage the way in which we do things, um, which, you know, I I if we didn't have them, yeah, we probably wouldn't be able to achieve a lot of the things that we do achieve, so, mm. yeah. Yeah. So what other channels then, you mentioned websites, what are your big channels, the drivers outside of the social media? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we've got, a, we've got an email database of, uh, you know, 25 million people. Um, yeah, so that's um, relatively that's relatively sizable. Um, obviously, I love that relatively sizable. Yeah, yeah. Um, you nothing but understated. That's right. Um, yeah, but so that's that's pretty good. Um, we've uh, obviously our app. Um, yeah, we, we've built our own kind of you know, app user database of um, you know over thirty million people as well. Um, you know, across uh, all of our websites, obviously as a result of that, we collect like an abundance of data, which allows us to you know like connect with people through different channels. Um, uh, we, even with the social thing, like yeah, we're still kind of introducing ourselves to new, you know, to new channels. So we've we've never really been huge on YouTube. It's something we're kind of looking at now um, to expand our ability to reach people on the internet more. Um, you know, different advertising channels. I just yeah, we, we we typically view it as an omni-channel approach. Like, how do we get mm. as as big a database as possible and the most amount of channels possible, and then how do we move users from one platform to another so that we have multiple touch points? Mm. Um, because it's it's really important to have multiple touch points with the user, not just a single touch point. So, yeah. 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 Well, YouTube will be a good one for you because you've got so much video content yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can just push a lot of it across. Yeah. yeah. But we 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 view a lot of that kind of. You know, there's a the recency and frequency model. I don't know, uh, with you know, around marketing content. You know, so you know how how frequently does a user need to see content? Yeah, you know, and how recently should they have seen a piece of content in order to um, remain kind of you know, engaged with your brand? Like, like, so for some people, they'll want to see it legit every day. Mm. You know, but other people might only want to see it you know once every you know few weeks and whatever. So a lot of the stuff that we do with you know and have learnt with newsletters and ads and testing and this that the other is like there there is a variety of different consumers and they don't all want to do it the same way mm. so if we kind of make ourselves available everywhere then they kind of have the choice to you know be where they want to be and do what they want to do so mm. yeah 
So keep the net wide. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, yeah. Yeah, great. Mm. Okay, so one of the other things I wanted to talk about is the South Start Conference that's yeah. next week. Yeah. And you're speaking at that, and I was just saying to Nicola before, um, I originally met you at Majoran. You spoke yeah. at a mega, I was doing a mega yeah. program. I think it was 2015. Yeah. I can't remember. It was yeah. a while ago. Yeah. And you were sick. You came mm-hmm. in and you were like, yep, I'm not very well. I've got a cold, but mm-hmm. I'd said I'd come. So you did, which mm-hmm. I was impressed with. Mm-hmm. So what, that... 2015, how, how old would you have been then? Mm, or a 22, 23. Yeah, like, yeah, so this yeah. young guy comes yeah. in, like, you're still, you know, incredibly successful at that point already, but, you know, and then gave your time. I was really impressed. I was like, yeah, this is mm. fantastic. You know, this guy's come in and talking mm. about your journey mm. and you're still going and doing that. Why do you think it's so important to go along and mm. speak to the, at these events? how is the world meant to become a better place if not through the sharing of learnings that we have all had you know that is the reason why things like books and the internet you know uh, are so important in our lives um yeah i think uh so i think yeah my ability to better give back to people and help them to do well is, is obviously ultra important um and you know and and hopefully that'll maybe come back the other way as well um but i think also from a you know perhaps from a slightly more indirect but selfish perspective you know I, to be honest, think some of my greatest learnings have come out of trying to teach other people to do things I have already done. And the, the reason I usually say that is because if you have done something or you're doing something on a regular basis and it's, it's, it's autonomous for you, um, there actually is no thinking. Like you, you just do it, right? But then when someone says to you like, oh, how do you do that? You know, in order for you to communicate that, you can't just do the thing. Yeah, you actually have to break the thing down. Mm. Um, you know, so part of the way that I learned to, you know, really get better at, I guess, communicating what it is that I do and, you know, what it is that I've done and how I do it and what I'm thinking um, actually was to literally just teach people. So if someone said to me like, oh, like, how'd you make all those decisions about what to do with marketing? I was like, oh, well, hmm, it just kind of seemed obvious. But was it really, you know, and then like, so, oh, oh, well, actually, I went through this process and then that adds value to them. But it also kind of makes me realize like, oh, there was a legit process there. So if I want to be the best leader to my team, I've got to better communicate that to them. And now I just learn how to do that. So, Mm, yeah. yeah. So obviously then learning and that constant cycle of self-improvement is something that's important to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I I probably kind of take that to the extreme. Uh, But um, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, the notion of being an infinite learner is probably something that's very important to I think anyone that has any degree of business success, uh, yeah, if you if you don't stop learning, it's very unlikely that you're probably going to continue to grow and succeed. So, mm. so then that environment then for Adelaide and having South Start and, and running these sorts of conferences, what sort of impact do you think that has for you know the business community and the entrepreneur mm. startup community mm. in Adelaide? Yeah, look, I, I don't think that that value can be understated. Earlier on in my journey, like that would have been something I definitely would have really liked to have had. Um, but just wasn't necessarily around, you know, so even the, the Majoran thing where, you know, I initially first spoke that you saw, that was kind of half like, oh, I'll come along and talk and kind of half like, hmm, there's other people in Adelaide that are doing <laughs> things. I'd love to meet them, you know, so it was kind of half half. It, it just turned out that, you know, for me, um, you know, my, my role in that for the last few years was more along the lines of like, oh, well, I'll, I'll be the mentor and, and, and I'll try to help people as much as possible. But um, you know, rather than necessarily having, you know, be the person asking the questions. But I think regardless of which side of the conversation you sit on, um, that there's benefit to come out of it. And I think that that's something that, you know, that South Side, you know, I mean, already is doing a good job of um, before the event. And I think that the event will be something that will very much so stimulate a lot more of that in, in South Australia. Mm, well, because and Majoran is no longer that space. It's the Moonshine mm. Lab yep. now. Yep. So, but mm. they're still working in that same environment yeah. Yeah, and yeah, trying yeah. to bring people together and, and mm. connect it. And as you mentioned, there's some really great things happening in mm. Adelaide. I mm-hmm. mean, there's a lot of focus on the space and the space yep. research that's going on. Yep. And then also AI is mm. another big space. You mentioned briefly before AI. Is that something you guys have got involved in what you're doing? Um, so we, we leverage um, we leverage some of the technology and we don't necessarily do all of it like ourselves here, but we definitely leverage some of it. And I think that's you know, kind of around um, you know, like predictive lifetime value analysis um, among different user cohorts for the purposes of user acquisition. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, um, you said it, you delivered it well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but in other words, kind of you know, we say like, oh well, you know, based on all this historical data, like how can we make like you know um, predictions or assumptions with a decent degree of certainty to quantify what the realistic value is of a particular 
user. Therefore, if we're going to advertise to them, how much money can we actually afford to spend acquiring them? Mm. So again, that's probably not much more of a concise explanation, but um, that's just one of the examples. So, so the computer's yeah. doing crunching lots of data to tell yeah. you yeah. what the value of yeah. the person is. Eventually someone sees a product, yeah. So <laughs> some cool stuff happens, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Like I, I love that AI space and mm. what's happening in there. And, mm. Um, yeah, so, so there's going to be some interesting speakers yeah. on that. Mm. So Be The Drop mm -hmm. is based on my favourite quote, which is a waterfall begins with one drop. And yep. look what comes from that. So yep. I really like, you know, this mm. idea that through education and learning and bringing yep. people together, you can yep. create more powerful impact. Is there something that, you know, you sort of, or any particular quotes or um, mm. things that you, that resonate strongly with you? My favourite quote, or one thing that I think of very often, is that um, you know that there's no worse feeling than that of regret. And I think you know rather than that necessarily being an ultra famous quote from somebody, but more necessarily a, a philosophy around you know life and business that you know it, it's better to you know have tried and failed you know than to have not tried at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. Um, the, the mentality, and look, and I think this is a mentality in, in South Australia as well, right? Very specifically uh, related to business that it's like, oh, I don't want to do that because I might fail. And if I'm seen failing, then yeah, that sucks. And then, oh, I've lost all that time and this, that, and the other. And it's like, but if you do nothing, you also achieve nothing else. Mm. Yeah. And so for me, um, you know, I think there's been many times where, you know, we're kind of like, oh, no, like we won't do that because, oh, yeah, we might, mm, oh, it's a bit, you know, okay, mm. and then like 12 months later, we're like, okay, no, look, we'll finally do it. And all we've really achieved is literally we've just delayed ourselves by a year, you know. So um, now, you know, something that you know, I kind of pride myself on is the ability to do, like, make really quick decisions on a limited amount of information and just kind of go, I'm quite confident that it will do well, but if it does not do well, then we learnt that that's not the right thing. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your yeah. time, Toby. Thanks for having me. In conclusion, mm -hmm. I need Toby's Be The Drop tip. Okay. So, and your Be The Drop tip is your top tip for communication that connects and brings mm -hmm. people together. There's something that I very often you know, kind of refer to is that we should never underestimate the amount of impact that our actions and behaviour have on those around us. Um, and and so to add you know, kind of more context to that, there's kind of a lot of research in organisations and leadership and teams that goes on to kind of say that 70% you know, of the emotion and culture and behaviour in an organisation is dependent on that of the leader. You know, so in other words, what the leader is seen doing and how they're behaving and so on and so forth will drive the behaviour in other people. You know, I've always kind of been the, the sort of guy, like if you go and have a look at any of the other offices on the way out, you know, like I, I painted half of those offices you know, myself on weekends because it just had to be done. You know, I helped the tradies put them together. Um, you know, I'm the sort of guy that would you know, help the cleaner move stuff if they had to just because it's polite and it needs to be done. And you know, so I think as a result of that, like we've got a really tremendously generous and helping you know, like culture here at Sweat. Uh, and you know, so I think that that's probably how I'd pitch the tip. Yeah, fantastic! And what a great, yeah. great bit of advice. Thank yeah. you so much, Toby. No, thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Be the Drop. Don't forget to subscribe in order to ensure you never miss out on one of our weekly episodes. Be The Drop is produced by Narrative Marketing, where we believe that stories connect individuals and that powerful storytelling can positively impact the world. To unleash your storytelling superpower, visit narrativemarketing.com.au or check out our social links in the show notes. To contact me directly with any specific comments you have, you can email me via amelia at narrativemarketing.com.au. And don't forget that whilst a task or challenge may seem overwhelming, a waterfall begins with one drop and look what comes from that.